Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today um, at our fourth annual Critical Access Hospital virtual conference. Um, we're so glad to have you here with us and hope that you enjoyed today's session. Um, I will turn us over to my colleague, Opal Greenway. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I hope that you guys enjoyed day one on, for those who were able to attend of um, Region C's conference or if that you've been able to attend any of the other regions over the past couple of weeks. I know I really enjoyed Wade's and Blaine's presentation on cost report best practices. Um, so hopefully you guys um, got a lot out of information out of day one and then are ready and excited for day two where we're going to talk about provider compensation. So for those of you who have not been attending for the past four years, I want to go and go over a few housekeeping items. The, everybody's going to be muted throughout the presentation, except for myself. If you want to ask a question, we have both a Q&A and a chat function. Hillary is going to be monitoring that chat function to make sure I see if any chat um, questions come in. And um, you will also, all the slides and the recordings will be sent to all the registrants following the webinar. So this is being recorded. We have closed captioning. You guys should be able to get it on top of that. The way that we set up these um, sessions each year is really based on the feedback that we get from you and what's going on in the industry. So after I finish my presentation, you're going to receive a short survey asking about some feedback with regards to our conference session. This feedback is really helpful for us to figure out what was important to you guys, what do you guys need, what should we talk about in future sessions and other education that we do throughout the year. So a little bit about Stroudwater. Stroudwater has been around since 1985, and we have been focusing on rural our entire existence. So this is just a map of clients that we've worked with since 2017. As you can see, we've hit basically every single state. The only state that we have not worked with yet is in Delaware, not a, not a huge rural population there or, or critical access hospitals. So, but we are very blessed to have worked with everybody uh, from Alaska all the way down to Florida. And as you can see for Region C, we have been very, very busy in your area over the years. On top of that, Stroudwater is, was excited back in 2020 to launch Stroudwater Capital Partners. And as you can see, Stroudwater Capital Partners, which is our arm that helps you guys find funding primarily through USDA grants and USDA loans for your different capital needs and capital projects. We've worked with 17 different hospitals to close deals and allow them to get the funding that they need for replacement hospitals, expansion of services, medical equipment, et cetera. So very excited about all the work that Stroudwater Capital Partners has been doing across the country. A little bit about us as a firm, as I mentioned, we are a very rural focused advisory group working on your guys' strategic operational and financial needs. We have, uh, for those of you that attended Monday or Tuesday sessions, you've heard we do strategic planning, mergers and affiliations. You've heard a lot about our revenue cycle and um, what was going on in cost report and financials. Very important to all of our critical access hospitals. Um, but we also, I lead our provider advisory group. So everything, the provider hospital relationship, whether that is compensation, medical staff development, provider strategy, or clinic operations. We also have a fantastic clinical group um, that works especially with the quality of care, quality reporting, and as well as your um, nurse staffing and productivity. And I already mentioned our capital planning and access through Stroudwater Capital, as well as we have a great facilities group and an um, analytics team that many of you are using our different analytics tools, whether it's around swing, uh, swing bed or um, pricing transparency or your cost report. So we've been happy to be partnering with you guys, like I said, for nearly 40 years and um, been working with you. So let's go ahead and dive into today's um, presentation. So really today we're going to spend a talk about redesigning provider compensation. I wanna set the stage with this and talk about what's going on in the current compensation market. And because it is one of the big drivers as to what's happening in the compensation market, I am gonna go over some of the compliance requirements it's not just because I am a, a lawyer that I'm going to bore you guys with legal stuff. It's because this stuff matters. We're actually having critical access hospitals now get dinged by the Department of Justice for these types of things. It's not just the big hospital health systems anymore and the for-profits. We have actual critical access hospital clients who are now facing a lot of these compliance issues. And then I'm going to really want to spend time with you guys talking about a case study, a compensation engagement that we did with a critical access hospital in Region C 
that we really have spent the better part of a year working through of helping them redesign their provider compensation. So I'm going to talk to you about how did that engagement come about? What were they facing? Why did they even want to look at their compensation? And then, you know, how we went through that process and where they're at now. So to kick things off, talking about what's going on in the compensation market. Some of you are like, wait a minute, Opal, I've seen this slide, I, I swear, you know, within the past couple of years. It's because the same forces are actually impacting our overall provider compensation. There's different things that are driving compensation for providers up. Supply and demand, it's a basic economic principle, right? The, we have shortages, the lower supply that's going on, the more and the more demand, compensation is going to go up. We're still feeling the impacts of COVID-19. And a lot of that has to do with, with the pandemic. A lot of people weren't sure what to do with regards to provider compensation. And so I will say a lot of organizations divorced what they were doing for compensation and how the organization was getting paid. We were using CARES Act funds in order to make payroll, to be able to provide our comp, um, our different physicians, nurse practitioners, CRNAs, and um, physician assistants with compensation. We didn't want to lose our providers during a pandemic when we desperately needed them, but we didn't know what our volumes were going to be. We didn't know how many providers we needed. We just know there's a shortage. And so we needed to make sure we kept who we had. And so we really, since we didn't have the revenue coming in the door on the outpatient side, we used our CARES funds to hold providers harmless. We started creating other types of compensation during the pandemic to try to meet their different needs. And so that has really impacted also how providers look at their compensation and what's important to them. On top of that, because why not while we're dealing with the pandemic, CMS did a very drastic overhaul of the physician fee schedule and how it measures productivity. And so those productivity changes really impact provider compensation, especially in the primary care space. Primary care space saw a huge overhaul to how CMS treated their work reviews and their value. And um, with that, we actually have an increased transparency with regards to survey data. So providers are sharing per, um, survey data more openly and with one another. But the thing is, is, and I'll get into one of the issues with regards to survey data, is if everybody pays the median and median is now treated as the floor, it's not median anymore, right? A lot of organizations think that they can only, if they don't pay at least that, then they're not going to be able to be competitive. And so it drives compensation up. There are a few things that are pushing back on these upward trends, right? It can't just go up and up and up and up. And part of it is, to my knowledge, I have yet to meet a CFO who has a printing press in his office or her office, right? We can't just make, you know, the money's just not rolling into our hospitals anymore. So that scarcity resources means there's a limit. There's a, we're going to have financial sustainability challenges if we don't address what's going on with our provider compensation. On top of that, as I mentioned, it is very regulated, right? There are compliance rules around this thing called fair market value that we are going to discuss. And fair market value kind of puts a cap at what you can pay, right? There is a limit. You can't just write an, a blank check to providers to see patients. Now, there's a few things that have been actually neutral that we thought were going to have more of an impact. The transition to value-based care. It hasn't been nearly as fast as we thought. We thought that you know value-based reimbursement was going to actually transform a lot of things with regards to provider compensation. Because it has moved so slowly and we're not there yet with being in value-based reimbursement where the majority of our payments are tied to those core pieces of value-based um, value -based care, Compensation really hasn't changed because of it, right? There's, we're seeing compensation, some of this stuff be factored into compensation, but it's not changing the total amounts in any significant way. On top of that, the Stark Law has had changes, but none of the changes that have happened in recent years have really driven compensation up or down. It's just transformed a little bit, making certain things easier to access as to how you pay providers. Now, when we think about rural specifically, we're in an area where the difficulty for recruitment and our lack of access to specialists is actually really hitting in compensation specifically. Whether that is, hey, we have a difficult time recruiting, so we feel like we need to pay more, or our lack of access to specialists means we need primary care providers who are able to tap into different specialties, who can especially provide women's health and OBGYN services because we're not able to recruit into that market. Or we're going to have to look at how do we create access to specialists through things such as telehealth, right? Or visiting providers. And so that has impacted compensation a bit, especially, hey, if we can have access to some visiting providers or telehealth, 
what does that mean and how do we compensate for things like that? So we always are having to stay attuned to what's going on with the market. So getting into a little bit more detail on some of these things, right? Basic rules of economics, the bigger the demand and the smaller the supply compensation is going up. But what exactly is happening with our physician supply and demand? And so the Amer Association for American Colleges, Medical Colleges tracks this regularly. I remember actually earlier on in my career where we were really excited about population health and Kaiser Permanente and the Kaiser Foundation did a lot of modeling of depending on what happens with population health, we may not have a shortage, right? We're not going to have to worry about the supply of providers because we're going to be so good at population health and preventative health. Utilization is going to plummet and we're not going to have a shortage. You'll see in this updated um, map from 20, you know, from 20 that projected it from 2019 to 2034, there is no scenario anymore that they see that we do not have a shortage of at least 37,800 physicians, right? This is pre-pandemic, right? They updated this last in 2019, and they're saying there is no longer a scenario with population health that we feel confident that we can project that there's not going to be a shortage. Now, what has happened with COVID, right? Since the, this, the last time they actually updated the supply and demand chart was pre-COVID. Well, COVID, we've recognized a lot more the disparities that are creating that these shortages are experienced more greatly in certain areas, whether it is our access to care by, for minorities or people without health insurance. But they actually specifically called out that those living in rural communities are disproportionately impacted by these shortages. And so if we look at these overall healthcare patterns and what the different barriers are, and we actually account for these populations being like the norm, then our shortage is really closer to up to upward of 180,000 physicians, right? Physicians, not including the fact that we know we also have shortages in nurse practitioners. It's just not as extreme, right? But if we actually were trying to make things equitable across the different um, types of organizations and, and um, populations, that's a significant, at least we're going to be 100,000 short, no matter what. Now, Things that have caused this is also the supply has gone down. It's not just, hey, demand has demand has increased and we're sicker. It's people, there was an interruption of education, training. We have, I mean, we've experienced this also like with our nurses. People are graduating without having done in-person clinicals. You know, training was halted there. So people are coming in less confident and needing a little bit more supervision as they, you know, start their first full-time positions in our rural communities. We had some regulatory changes. There's been changes in reimbursement. Um, student loans have gone up substantially. And so providers are worried about being able to have access to being able to repay it, repay those student loans. So they're shifting of let's not pursue, phys you know, an MD, let's pursue maybe becoming a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant or exiting completely. We have had some significant workforce exits of providers saying, I'm going to go into consulting, I'm going to go into academia, I am going to go into private equity, other things, or I'm going to retire early. We saw this as a result of the pandemic and it's really hit our provider supply and demand. And so luckily we do have access to things such as telehealth um, that is allowing these populations to be able to have access to providers that can't be there in person, but it's still very, very limited with especially issues with broadband um, access. And also, I will, will point out the lack of residency programs. We have more and more people actually starting to go to medical school without residency spots available for them. One of the big regulatory hurdles that you know people are thinking about is the requirements for starting a rural, a rural residency program. I was meeting with a hospital in Louisiana back on Tuesday, and they are trying to, it's, um, it's a small rural hospital, they have been trying to create a residency program to do more training for rural health care, and it's been for the past five years. And then the hurdle is so high to get approved that they're just, they know that, that there's two different hospitals that know they're just basically not going to be able to get these rural residency programs. And so that's going to impact their future supply because we know that providers have a tendency to continue to practice where they train. If they don't train in rural, they're not going to practice in rural. As I mentioned, because you know we weren't busy enough with a pandemic, in 2021, CMS did a huge overall overhaul to the physician fee schedule. And really what they were trying to address was primary care had changed so much, the documentation, you know, EM codes. 
that we were doing, it, it had an increased burden over the years and it was not being recognized. So CMS said, let's play catch up. We're gonna try to make up for the past seven years and do it all in one fell swoop. And so they increased what the physician fee schedule, what the work RVUs were for a lot of primary care or related CPT codes. And so as you see here on the chart, you look at primary care, you look at urgent care, family medicine, internal medicine, all of these having nearly 20% increases on their work RVUs. Not saying that's not warranted, but if you were paying your providers on a productivity basis where they got certain compensation based on how many work RVUs they generated, here we are in a pandemic, organizing like, I can't afford a 24% increase in compensation for my urgent care providers or 20% increase in compensation for family med. When organizations started um, you know, modeling this out, they realized that this is not, this was not sustainable for them. This was not doable in one fell swoop. What were they going to do about that? On top of that, they were, let's increase work our views, but let's cut the reimbursement behind it, right? So we've been seeing our conversion factors go down. <coughs> so, so what did organizations do about this? A lot of organizations still today in 2024 are not, if they pay on productivity, are not calculating their work RVUs off of the current physician fee schedule. They're still using the 2020 schedule. Now, when organizations were asked before, like, what's your plan for this? You can see that at the time back in 2021, because organizations knew that they couldn't necessarily afford this, like, we don't know when our implementation is going to be maybe a quarter of them said, we should be able to do this, you know, hey, within the next year. Another 20% said maybe in the next two years. A third said by 2023. I will say in my experience, and we, Stroudwater just did our second annual um, rural provider compensation survey, there are still a significant, and I, when I say significant, at least 25% of organizations are still not using the current physician fee schedule for calculating their providers' work RVUs. Now, hopefully those organizations are using the current physician fee schedule for their billing, you know, right? For Amy on Revenue Cycle would have told you, she's like, you absolutely have to use the current physician fee schedule for compliance and for your revenue cycle. But when it comes to calculating their providers' productivity, they're using old schedules. And so, you know, it was a game of kick the can down the road. And really a lot of organizations are still trying to kick that can or they're reevaluating how they're, what they're, what is their compensation model? Should it even be tied to work RVUs anymore? Right? They're questioning, they, they, they're realizing we have to relook at this. We can't kick the can down the road anymore. Um, when I talk about that physician fee schedule, right? So again, this is some changes that we're seeing just from 2023 and 2024. So we're still seeing some of those changes. It's no longer that drastic change that we're seeing of 20% increases. But there's still some significant ones out there, you know, a lot more focused on the specialists in recent years because the way that initially we were going to pay for those increases in primary care was going to be through, hey, we'll have decreases in the specialty cares. Instead, what they did is a lot of lobbying went on and a lot of the specialists, it, came, it stayed neutral. They didn't have a change at all. So now here we are three years later. And so you're starting to see the specialists start having increases. Okay, sports medicine, you know, rheumatology, oncology, et cetera, we're starting to see. But again, they're nowhere near as drastic as the different um, increases that we saw in 2021 for primary care. So I mentioned something with regards to the survey data, right? Right now, there's several surveys out there, AMGA, Sullivan, Cotter, um, MGMA, right? There's a lot of national organizations that focus on entirely doing the sur on these surveys to find out what are providers paid and what, you know, what is that tied to? What is their productivity? What are their encounters? You know, how many patients are they seeing for that? And providers are getting, you know, printouts of MGMA data and they're sharing it with one another. Great. The problem with survey data is, is a couple of things. One, people don't know what's in the survey data. So I have had so many organizations mistake the survey of saying that this is just base compensation. So base compensation for a primary care provider, they're thinking is $240,000, as opposed to each one of these surveys that, that, I, um, that we subscribe to and are publicly available are looking at total cash compensation, total 
cash compensation. So if you're paying them a medical directorship, if you're paying them call compensation, if you're paying them APP supervision, if you're giving them a shift, hey, I have my clinic doc come in and do rounds or take a hospital shift, an extra shift, all of that compensation, it specifically states on a lot of these surveys of use box five of the W-2 to report compensation. So it's not base salary, right? It's not just, and so providers mistakenly think that that is going to be just base salary. So if you think it's base salary and you layer incentives on top of that, you can see how, oh wait, I went from thinking I was paying median to now I'm paying the 75th percentile of survey data. On top of that, the national surveys out there do skew urban, right? When we look at the number of rural respondents for people who are in communities that are servicing populations of less than 50,000, <clears> there's not very many providers. So you look at this, this is from the most recent MGMA data that was published three weeks ago. Look at the counts here, right? Here are the number of providers. So, so group count is total number of organizations. Count is number of providers within those organizations within that specialty. So nurse prep, so this is for, this is me, I filtered it for just the rural respondents, right? Where there was enough data. These are the only specialties where you have sufficient compensation data where they report it, right? And you look at this primary care, there's only 1100 primary care providers who are reflected in this data at all, right? For women's health, you're talking about 93 total providers in the country that you're comparing to. Otherwise you're comparing to urban data. And so it's not the same. I, I've been working with a hospital in Montana that says that we've been talking about their emergency room, that they need people that the nearest place for them to send somebody is four hours away. They need different levels of training for emergency medicine than somewhere in, say, Minneapolis, where they're going to have access to specialists, right? They may see a high volume ED in Minneapolis, but they also have on call of every specialty that they could possibly want to be able to send somebody to versus this hospital in rural Montana that absolutely does not have access and it's four hours away. They need people with more extensive training. And so how is that apples to apples from a compensation standpoint, right? How, like, how are you supposed to figure out what am I supposed to pay this provider? Because I don't know how this actually compares to the survey data but I do know my, my provider came in with a print off of the MGMA data or the Sullivan Cotter data. So, and um, when I say that, I, I'm gonna get into the compliance stuff here in a minute, <clears throat> is that people also mistake survey data as being within compliance. So I recently had an organization that literally, when I asked them, hey, can you, we're doing an engagement, can you send me copies of your fair market valuation reports that explain why you pay the way you do, right? And what they sent me was, oh yeah, we definitely have fair market valuation in place for all of our providers. You know, we, we have a great compliance program. We don't want to get in trouble. And what they sent me was a print off of AMGA. And then I'm like, okay, this is survey data. Where's your fair market valuation? And the response was, that is it. As long as I don't go over the max number on that sheet, I should be in compliance, right? No, that is not what compliance is. They genuinely thought that as long as they didn't go over the 90th percentile, then they would be fine, right? That is not what the survey data is intended for. That is not how it's supposed to be utilized. And so, or they, people pick bits and pieces. They'll just say, oh, what is the appropriate comp per worker review? Let's, let's just play median that not recognizing what is the relationship between comp per work RVU versus total compensation versus work RVUs and how does that data actually interact with each other. So those limitations to survey data, I will say, because I have to say thank you to everybody, especially Region C, you guys were our highest level of respondents for that Stroudwater partnered last year with NRHA and this year we partnered with both NRHA and NOSOR to do the second annual Rural Provider Compensation Survey which the publication, the full report should be available at the end of July. Um, some of you have seen previews if you attended um, some of the other regions where we went over some of the initial data of what we were seeing in primary care. So thank you everybody who participated in that because that I will say we have over the double the number of rural, it's only rural data and we have over double the number of rural providers from the next highest survey out there in the market. So <laughs> when I mentioned a scarcity of resources, right? 
what's driving compensation down. Hospitals can't afford it. We had 178 rural hospitals close since 2010, right? You think about how many rural hospitals have closed. So look at how many critical access hospitals have closed, right? And we're, um, you know, complete closures or at least some sort of service con um, closure. Luckily, some hospitals have been able to convert to a REH status or convert to another kind of status to stay paid. But look at all the closures that we have had. And when you look at this, you're like, part of it is, is because it's not fun. They're in financially unsustainable times, right? And a, you can't look at this and say, did they re-examine their provider compensation? Did they make sure that they were doing, did they have financial sustainability in mind, you know, for, what, for the five years leading up to this? Were they evaluating how they were paying because provider compensation is a big ticket item? Was it well aligned between how we pay our providers and how we make money as an organization? Was there alignment between those two things, right? <laughs> So let's get into the compliance requirements. I promise you, I try to keep this interesting, so please don't fall asleep just because it's legal stuff, okay? Now, why, do, why, why does this even matter, okay? It's our single biggest line item usually on our PNL, right? Provider salaries and benefits, pro, um, you know, professional contracts for our professional services agreements and our contracted providers. Most of you on this call have used locums in the past three years. You know it's expensive. So we have to pay attention to it, right? If you're not paying attention to your most expensive line item, then you, know, then you are not on a path for financial sustainability. I can guarantee it. On top of that, the government looks at this a lot, right? It is very, very heavily regulated. And then all the things that I've just been talking about for the past 20 minutes, right? Change is happening and it's happening quick and it's being significant. So if you have misalignment right now, between your organizational strategy, what's going on in the industry and your current compensation, you may be at significant risk for compliance problems, but also financial sustainability and your competitiveness of what to be able to recruit. Providers are expecting different things now and especially transparency. They want to understand why they are paid the way that they are at, a, at an increasing rate that I have not seen you know, 10 years ago. 15 years ago, I was not seeing providers that are like, you know, wanting to have this level of how much am I making? How do I make more? How do, you know, how does it balance with, how do I maintain, you know, work-life balance? How do I maintain the clinical care that I want to give, et cetera, you know, and how does that compare out in the industry, right? We didn't have that level of transparency 10, 15 years ago. And so providers want that transparency. And if you can't give it to them, if they can't understand and follow exactly how they're going to get paid, then they're not happy and they will leave. All right. So what are the laws that I'm talking about? You know, what is this legalese that you guys are required to pay attention to and that you guys are required to stay in compliance with? The first one is the Stark Law. So the Stark Law and the Anti-Kickback Statute are actually very, very similar. Stark Law is what's called a civil law, right? You can't go to jail for violating it. Okay. And under the Stark Law, basically, it's saying you're not supposed to have a financial relationship with somebody who can refer patients, you know, that where their services that they're going to get paid for are from Medicare and Medicaid. Kind of that simple. Unless it meets a certain exception. One of those big exceptions that people rely on is as long as you're paying them within fair market value. If you pay within fair market value, you are allowed to have this financial relationship, such as employ a provider, right? Or contract with a provider. You can have a financial relationship where money exchanges hands between the two, uh, between the provider and the paying organization, as long as it meets this one of these exceptions. And the big one is fair market value. Now, here's the thing with the Stark Law. It's a civil law, but it's a strict liability law, which means they do not care what you intended. You may have the best intentions of the world. You might be trying your hardest to follow the rules. If you don't dot every I and cross every T, you can be in a technical violation. And if you're in a technical violation, you're in a violation and you will be penalized, right? It doesn't matter if you try to do all the right things if you don't do the right things. It's not how hard you try, right? Um, then there's the anti-kickback statute. This one is criminal. You can go to jail. I don't know if your state's 
You use orange jumpsuits or gray jumpsuits or a classic black and white. And unless you really like how you look in that color and that such, the anti-kickback statue you can land you in there. Now, okay, when we say this, you're from an organization who actually, the hospital doesn't go to jail. Who goes to jail in these situations if you actually have an anti-kickback statute violation? It's usually the CEO, the CFO, and potentially the provider. Every now and then it's a board chair, but that's typically it's the CEO or the CFO who end up in jail in these circumstances. So if you have any CEOs or CFOs on this call, this is your wake up call. If you're starting to fall asleep, think how do I look in black and white stripes or orange or you know beige or gray um, jumpsuits, right? So um, again, that's the criminal one. Now, the thing about a criminal one, we're not gonna send people to jail if they tried and failed. It's a matter of you had to actually know what you were doing in this situation. You willfully blur up the wall. You realized you were paying outside of fair market value and you really just didn't care. That happens, that like, that does happen. We do have people in jail right now as a result of this. And every year there are people going to jail in this. It's just the ones that make the big headlines have to do with money. Right. So you you tend to see the star lobbying. in. Now, what's the penalty for this? Right. When I say, OK, it's a penalty. Is this a slap on the wrist or is it really bad? OK, since it's unlikely that anybody on this call hopefully is going to end up going to jail. Let's talk about the one primarily. What's the actual financial penalty? The thing about the Stark Law is that if you violate it, it is presumed it is basically a violation of the Medicare False Claims Act. Now, what happens when you violate the Medicare False Claims Act? It's triple damages. Triple damages of what, right? So those triple damages are, they look at the entire length of the financial, re the contract in place, right? The relationship between those two parties, the entire life of that, and say every single Medicare or Medicaid claim that went out during that entire life of that contract times three right, in triplicate. So three times, whatever that is. So let's say a provider's worked at your organization for 10 years and you've never updated their contracts and it still says the, says the same thing and you've given them, change, you know, bonuses or increases and it's, you know, not, and it turns out it's not within fair market value. Let's just say on average, that provider sends out a million dollars worth of Medicare claims in a year. That's $10 million worth of claims times three, $30 million. As a critical access hospital, the idea that a $30 million penalty is not going to sink your ship is not realistic, right? It can completely sink your ship if you got hit with a $30 million problem. And so, and on top of that, we go into a lot of rural organizations that don't have contracts. They can't find the contract. Like somebody wrote it somewhere when, at some point. But this provider's worked here for 20 years. And so nobody knows where the contract is. Nobody can find it. Nobody knows if we've been paying according to the contract. I can tell you, if you don't know where your contracts are and what they say, you have not dotted your I's, you have not crossed your T's, you have risk. You have significant risk. And the longer that provider has been billing to Medicare under your organization, the high, you know, the, the bigger the penalty associated with that, right? And so on top of that, a lot of the critical access hospitals we work with are not for profit hospitals. So you're also subject to private endowment laws, right? Those are only for not for profit hospitals. And they basically under private endowment laws, it says that compensation, you know, you're supposed to have it be a fair compensation for a comparable position. And so it's similar to fair market value where is, is it market compensation for the services provided? And what happens if you violate your private endowment is you could lose your not-for-profit status. On top of that, there could be the penalty, right, of whatever tax benefits you've um, received as a result of, for your not-for-profit status during the course of the inappropriate compensation you may have to pay back. That's how your penalty would be calculated. Again, that penalty oftentimes is a lot less than the Medicare false claims one, so that's not the scary number. Now, when we look about this being like, okay, but just how big is this? The DOJ was so proud of themselves. They um, they published back in February, right? Back into for the year of 2023, they had $2.6 billion in settlements, 1.8 billion of which were directly related to the laws that I'm talking about, right? $1.8 billion, okay? 
some of that's coming from rural. It's not just all, you know, the community health network that just got hit with a major penalty, you know, over a hundred million dollars. It's not just these massive ones like that, that make major headlines. It includes rural hospitals. We have a rural hospital in Texas, a critical access hospital, right? So just like you, and the CEO, I, I met her at NRHA last year, was telling me that she's a new CEO coming in after the whole C-suite has been eliminated because they got hit with a $5 million penalty. $5 million for not dotting their I's, not crossing their T's, not being in compliance with this. And so that's devastating for her hospital. Yeah, they came up with a, you know, a payment plan over the next five years, so they didn't have to shut down the hospital, but it's still significant. A $5 million penalty is not something to just sneeze at. It didn't make any headlines, right? It wasn't on national news that a critical access hospital got a $5 million penalty. We don't make the news, but it still hurts our communities when these things happen. All right, so when I say $2.6 billion, right, how does this stuff happen? Like, is the government just looking, you know, like how are they going to just show up at my door and ask me how much did I pay my providers this year? Most of these cases happen as a key TAM suit, right? It's a whistleblower because um, there's big money in it. If you think that an organization is paying inappropriately and you have, you know, good information about that, you can be a whistleblower. So oftentimes it's a departing CFO or a provider who's unhappy you know, because they didn't get the deal that they wanted, or they felt like somebody got an overly generous deal, and they become a whistleblower. Now, why bother doing that? Because whistleblowers get 15 to 30% of the penalties that the government collects. And in 2023, that was 300, over $340 million directly went to these whistleblowers for saying, now given these cases take three to six years. So one of the things that happened, I remember I was at the American Health Lawyer Association's conference back in 2017, and um, one of the U.S. district attorneys was there and pointed out that the DOJ would has, was focusing on rural. This is 2017. Seven years ago, the DOJ said, we are now tur turning our eyes towards rural. Smaller regional systems, smaller hospitals. We feel like the larger organizations, we've been targeting them for so long. They're learning their lessons. They're getting their ducks in a row. We now have to know, focus on the little guys. Now, that, and so a lot of, I, I started talking about this in 2017 of, hey, DOJ's coming, you know, they're, they're going to be paying attention to this, but it wasn't hitting the news. And the reason for that is to do these cases usually takes three to six years. Right. So a whistleblower call. So a case that I recently worked on as an expert witness was um, the issue happened in 2016. Right. So somebody basically alerted the government that they were concerned about something that was going on back in 2016. The government basically spent two years investigating and said, OK, of like, do we even want to bother looking into this more? Then they did look into it and it took another two years of legal process before they were even in the true lawsuit phase of like, let's get expert witnesses to, you know, and like set up to go to trial. So you look at this and we're already in 2021. Things basically came to a halt a little bit because of COVID for um, for that specific lawsuit. And then it came up again, basically, we, we did our expert witness stuff to, and it took another year, right? So you look at how long that took, that's why we're just now hearing about rural getting hit. Right, a small hospital in West Virginia that just got hit, that got hit with one point five million dollars a couple of um, years ago. I personally live in Tennessee, and I remember when Cookville was the Tennessee hospital got four point one hit with four point one million dollars. And the reason why that one stood out to me so much that's not a critical access hospital; it's decent size, but it's still considered a rural hospital and further away, right? And outside of the Nashville urban area, it's a good t uh, hour and a half, two hours away that hospital is they got hit by $4.1 million in February. They got hit with a tornado in March, beginning of March, and then the pandemic hit. The fact that that hospital is still open is like kudos to them because it was like one thing right after another. So I'll never forget that hospital that this was the first thing that they faced in, you know, in their triple hit. So we look at this and, you know, these hospitals are going to hit. Well, why does the Department of Justice spend so much time on this? It's $2.6 billion, but isn't it expensive? For every dollar that the government spends investigating these and going after, they get 4.3, $4.30. A 4.3 X return, that's big money. That's worth it to them, right? 
Now, when I talk about this, a lot of people are just here, oh my goodness, this hospital had to pay so much money, right? And they don't think about when they're like talking to the providers, it sounds like it's the hospital's problem. It's not just the hospitals, the individual physicians, nurse practitioners, et cetera, that this applies to, it's their problem too. So a recent violation, this one was just a few months, uh, it was just last year, right? There were three Michigan hospitals, smaller hospitals that ended up having to settle for $69 million. The compensation that we're talking about was paid between 2006 and 2016. I say that to emphasize 2006 to 2016, and we're not hearing about it until March of 2023, right? So a significant amount of time has passed. Okay, what are the kinds of things that they didn't do, right? And they had medical directorship agreements that were not in compliance. And for one of those hospitals, the specific issue is they had multiple medical directors of the same specialty. I've seen this in rural hospitals. I see rural hospitals with three different family medicine providers, all with medical directorships. And their argument is, oh, I need a different medical director for each RHC right? Well, one, that's actually not true that you need a different medical director for each one. And the amount of the medical directorship, they basically were having to do a little bit of supervision and attend once a quarter a one hour meeting, but they were paying them an extra $20,000 each. From a fair market valuation standpoint, those things don't line up, right? The idea that you're paying basically $5,000 an hour for a meeting for meetings is not a medical directorship. In, like in the true net, true sense of that medical director, based off especially based off that compensation, um, the physician employment agreements they did not they weren't within fair market value. They were they were basically paying outside of that range of fair market value, and at least um, one of them was definitely overpaying. You can't un, you can't underpay. Um, and then one of these instances, it was because they felt like they were getting the payment off of um, rental agreements instead. Right? They were they were getting it elsewhere. <clears throat> the physician owned group basically had purchased medical equipment also to lease to the hospital and they didn't you know they didn't use the proper channels they were and that agreement of how they were setting up this lease was not within fair market value so 69 million dollars the physicians themselves had to pay seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So when people, when so when if you are a hospital you know leader and are having a conversation with providers and saying okay I, I really need you to be educated on this start block. Like, this is why we're doing this. We're going to relook at compensation or we're going to evaluate this. And the reason for that is because it's not just looking out for the hospital. You're not just looking to make sure that your CEO doesn't go to jail and you can afford it. It's the providers themselves also. They have liability, right? They are going to have to pay. The government will do an analysis as to where the liability should fall between the hospital and the physician. Yes, the hospital will always have the bigger ticket per penalty, but oftentimes the physicians do have penalties as well. So how do you stay in compliance, right? I talk about all this legalese and scare you guys with number, you know, scary things that you might have to pay. And especially if you're not dotting your I's and crossing your T's. So how do you dot your I's and you cross your T's? The biggest one is you need to be paying in what's called fair market value. What is fair market value? So by definition, it is basically what a hypothetical, you know, what one, what parties will exchange from a money perspective for, you know, the universe of the market of universe of potential employers, hospitals, et cetera, would pay a provider of this type for services rendered. What are those services? So who's paying, who are they paying for what? And is that within market, right? That That's all it is. Simple as that, At our, you know, thinking about it in arm's length, nobody's under distress and they both have relevant knowledge of the facts, right? So nobody's hiding anything from one another. Um, they're being transparent and, it, and it's within market. But it, again, it's for the services rendered. So how do we look at fair market valuation? Okay. I like to think of it as there's the provider and the position. So there's that individual, what does that individual bring to the table that they, that is unique about them? that you should be paying attention to, such as their training and experience. A provider with 20 years of experience, or I'll go, let's go back to that hospital I'm talking about in Montana, right? They needed a provider who had the specific, they were looking for a specific level of experience. So they only, you know, they were only were going to fill this position with a provider with five years of direct emergency department in a rural setting, um, you know, that kind, that kind of training. 
that could be able to triage. They didn't, weren't going to bring in somebody who can intubate, right? On their, you know, they they didn't want to be in a position where, wait, where's a CRNA? Who's somebody who can actually intubate? They needed an ED provider who could regularly intubate patients if necessary. So what is that individual person? So they didn't want somebody right out of school. So what was their training and experience? Um, sometimes I will say one of the great things that we see in rural is when I see um, actually um, military sur general surgeons come in and or trauma surgeons and then working in a rural uh, for a rural hospital because they have the training and experience that they're like I can do you know I can do any surgery with very limited resources so they're you know a great area to be able to try to recruit from is if you know any mil you know military doctors who are going to the the civil side of things be like come and work at our hospital when you become a civilian, right? So that's a specific kind of provider. Then there's also the position. Okay, what's their specialty or subspecialty? Family medicine with or without OB, right? Are they gonna be, pro and then what are their specific duties and responsibilities? Are they going to be covering C-section? Are they gonna be taking call? Are they gonna come in and round on patients? Do you have a hospitalist program? Is family med also going to basically be your hospitalist? Are they going to have to take ED shifts, right? The kinds of things that we see in rural all the time. So what are what is the full scope of their duties and responsibilities? Do they have administrative responsibilities? You know, are they also a medical director? Do they have to supervise APPs? Are you in a, re I'm talking to Regency, so most of you luckily are a full practice state, but for those that are in a restricted practice state, what is the scope of their license? Are a nurse practitioner that based off of the laws can actually practice the full extent of their license, or they might have all the training and experience, but I'm never gonna allow them to be able to use it because I'm in a restricted practice state, so they can't actually provide the same level of care, right? They might have all that training and experience, but I can't use, I can't tap into that. So looking at that, what is the full scope of their duties and responsibilities? Are you trying to fulfill a specific community need? We have to keep on talking about shortages. Are you in a situation where you don't have enough primary care providers and it's a three month wait for a new patient to establish in your clinic? You know, do you, coming out of the pandemic, do you have an abnormally amount, a uh, high amount of COPD? So you have a specific high disease incident rate. Are you having a lot of out migration because you don't have access? And so we're having issues where patients are having to travel an hour plus to go to, to get, you know, endocrinology because we don't have access to, we don't have any family medicine providers who have any of that specialized training in our community. Do you have seasonality adjustments where, you know, a perfect example for those of you who might be, you know, based in Montana or Colorado, where we have ski resorts, where we have, you know, peak seasons in the summer and in the winter for our, out, like our outdoor recreational areas, right? So that kind of seasonality, I need a provider full time. They're going to be busier in the summer and the winter, and then they're not going to be very busy in the spring, right? Our, we're just going to have our main population and now we're not going to have all the patients I'm going to need them to see during those times, but I still need, I can't just have a provider only during the high peak seasons. So what is my community? Is there a specific community benefit you're trying to address, right? Are you developing a new service, something that you guys haven't had before? Are you going, are you doing a specific population health initiative? Are you trying to establish behavioral health for the first time in your community? Right. So is there a specific benefit to that community that you like you don't necessarily know if it's a need, but it's going to be a benefit to the community? Are you do you want to pay more to have a provider live in the community? Because providers who live in a community tend to be stickier, right? Is there a premium that we can pay for having somebody actually live in our community and be a part of that and patients be familiar with them? Right. That's a key one that that is actually a well-established community benefit that not just a relocation amount, but you can pay more if your provider actually lives in your community and is not commuting from elsewhere. So a lot of, and I, I'm gonna pause for the, on the compliance part to point out from a rural recruitment and being competitive, a lot of times I see rural organizations try to excuse their community away of, oh, you know, go live, um, go live in Eau Claire, right? That's a bigger place in Wisconsin. And, you know, you can just commute over to Rice Lake, right? When you need to, or up to Ladysmith. Um, yeah, it's, it's a long commute, but you can go live in a bigger or like a bigger place and not actually be part of our community. Just come on the days that you are working, right? So that they're trying to be able to get providers to come over there. But what if instead we said, actually, we want you to be a part of this community and we'll actually pay to make sure you can be a part of this community. We'll pay you a little bit more to come. 
be involved in the community, right? So that you're that it's not a burden to ask you to go to Rotary or to oh, um or you know to the to the Masonic Lodge or something of that nature, right? To actually, it's something when you see your provider in the grocery store and at the high school basketball game or whatever. Right. So what is that benefit? Can you think about it that way instead of saying, oh, it's just fine to commute in from elsewhere. Right. Consider the time it takes to recruit for that specific position. When it takes an abnormally long time to recruit, sometimes you have to increase what you're paying just to try to be able to fill the position. Now, I say that I say abnormally long time to recruit. Anytime we're down a provider, it feels like any amount of time is difficult for you to recruit in rural. But you have to actually be able to pay attention to how does it compare with what the averages are. So pre-pandemic, the national average was 260 days to get a primary care provider. Post-pandemic, it's over 366 days now. So that's considered what is now, unfortunately, normal. So when we say, do, can you pay more because it's taking a difficult time to recruit, it needs to exceed normal in order to make that kind of adjustment to compensation. So you expect that it's going to take a year to recruit. So you need to be actually really on top of your provider strategy of saying, if I know I have a retirement coming up and I know it takes at least a year to fill the position, I should probably start looking for people at least two years out before that retirement, recognizing I want some overlap, right? And it's going to take a time. This is one of the kind of the government's response to your lack of planning does not create an emergency on my part, right? So you have to, to be able to have additional compensation be part of fair market value has to be outside of what is concerned them. Then there's what is the compensation methodology and the amount. So if 100% of compensation is guaranteed, then and the provider assumes no risk, you can't pay as much as, oh, I'm going to have the provider take on quality risk initiatives where they could actually make less if they don't hit these quality metrics, or they can make more. When the provider takes on risk, you can pay a premium associated with the fact that they're taking that kind of risk. It's also what is, you know, what is the different methodology? Are you paying hourly for medical directorship, right? What's, what's the total amount? It's a different thing to, are you paying the 25th percentile or the 50th percentile? You know, what are like 25th is guaranteed, but they can make up to the 50th if they do these have a, th these different components Whereas if they were just guaranteed straight up the 40th percentile, right? Whether or not that's within fair market value, that's taken into consideration. And then I do say benchmark comparison. And the reason why I always emphasize benchmark comparison, even though I say when it comes to survey data, you have to remember who's doing enforcement of this, okay? It's lawyers. We are not experts necessarily in clinical care, right? You know, there's definitely some MDJDs out there, but for the most part, they're not experts in clinical care. So they don't know what it takes to necessarily see a patient, but they have to have some sort of benchmark. They have to have something to say, is this fair or not within this fair mark? They don't know the specifics of the specialty, the duties, the training, the methodology on its face. So if somebody, a whistleblower, or they're doing some, oftentimes some other kind of audit that figure that says we should look at provider contracting, if you're going for a USDA loan, right, where your financials are going to be under scrutiny and it raises questions about your compensation, that's a big one that could potentially lead you into an audit, right, is to think about your compensation if you're about to get, undergo a big USDA loan. Think about that is they have to have something to go off of. So they look at benchmarking. They look at the surveys. They say, OK, if this provider is paid median and their productivity is median by measured by work RVUs, that's probably within fair market value because I'm just looking at what's paid for the services provided and I'm going to measure services provided by work RVUs. So that seems like, okay, that must be within fair market value because those numbers are the same, 50-50. But what if you're paying the 60th percentile and productivity is down at the 20th? Hmm, that's a 40 point difference there. Again, with the government and the what people doing the enforcement of these laws, having nothing else to go off of, that raises a red flag for them. So like looking at those benchmark comparison, it's not on its face illegal. It's not on its face a problem. It is, you have to make sure the rest of your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed that you can explain why that variance exists. It's not that you can't have a variance. There just has to be a reason for it. And so we usually recommend that if anytime you're paying over the 70th percentile, 
or the variance between productivity in fair market and um, benchmark comparison compensation is greater than 10%, you should examine it. And if it's greater than 20 point difference, that's pretty high risk, right? That's And when I say pretty high risk, it merely means you really have to have your I's dotted and your T's crossed. You should have a fair market valuation in place and it shouldn't be a copy of a survey and say, well, I didn't go, as long as I didn't go over the 90th percentile. I'm talking about actual analysis of all these different components to say whether or not it's within fair market value. All right, so let's get into the fun stuff of, okay, you know, we did the legalese, we talked about the market, who's doing this, who's addressing this? So I wanna go over a case study, right, of a hospital that we worked with for part of 2022 and all of 2023, basically helping them figure out what to do about their compensation. So. I would want to point out compensation is basically what you pay people to be, do what the services that they're that you need them to provide, right? You're looking at okay, what is their time, their knowledge, their skills, their abilities? What is their commitment to your organization? And so, since it's what you pay people to do what you need them to do, then your organizational strategy compensation should always reward successfully contributing to the organizational strategy. When those things become divorced, like it did in the pandemic, where what drives organizational success and what drives incentives, if those things become divorced, then your compensation is more and more likely to be skewed. You have providers going, I, I hear this all the time, when I go and interview providers, I'm like, okay, hey, what are your organizational goals this year? And they have no idea. If their compensation was tied to organizational success and they knew what the goals were, I guarantee you would know they would be able to tell me what the organizational goals are and how what their place is in it if they are paid based off of it. Right. They if if they would not, but if there's there's no relationship there, then there's no reason for them to know the organizational strategy. And that's where we hear all the time. Nobody's told us. We don't know. We weren't at that meeting. Okay. So I'm talking about, it's a 25 bed critical access hospital, um, rural community middle, here in the Midwest, right? And the next PPS hospital, so that the, the, where they could would transfer to, where they had access to more specialists was about, was a little bit over 45 minutes away, right? New CEO joined the hospital. It was his first time being a CEO ever. However, he had been working with providers a lot. He'd been a director of outpatient services, okay? But first time in the CEO seat, and when he comes in, he realizes, oh, this organization is in trouble. They have been losing money. They're taking a big risk and bringing in an inexperienced CEO, and they want him, they wanted him to turn it around. And so realizing that they were losing money, he stepped back and said, okay, biggest ticket item on the P&L is provider compensation. Let me understand how the providers are paid. And he couldn't figure it out. It was inconsistent across, he, this provider makes this amount, this provider makes that amount, they bought up a rural health clinic, you know, and so all of those providers are, pay, are paid differently, and he, and he couldn't make heads or tails of it. There was no set strategy. They're like, why, you know, why is it? And then he started rounding with the providers and wanting their feedback. Hey, what's going well in the organization? What's going poorly? And almost every single provider, when he was doing rounds, said, I have no idea how I'm paid. There was no transparency. They're like, I haven't, some of the providers are like, I haven't had a raise in five years. What am I supposed to do? You know, inflation's at, the, at, the, at this time, he's like, inflation's at 9%. I don't know how to get a raise. So what's going on? And they also, so he said, okay, well, maybe I can go look at the fair market valuations and figure out, even though it's all very inconsistent, at least on an individual basis, maybe I can figure out how you're paid. He couldn't find a single fair market valuation in place. He could find and locate every single contract. So we'll give them that credit. They knew where every single contract for the providers were, but there was no consistency across the contracts, right? Like it looks like at least six or seven different people had written the contracts over years. Um, a lot of the, I mean, other than the name of the hospital was consistent across every one of them. That was about it. And there was a signature page for a CEO, but there were even different CEOs over this course of time. So seeing this, and this guy happens to be a fan of Ted Lasso, he says, uses the quote from Ted Lasso, there are two buttons I never like to hit, that's panic and snooze. So here he is thinking, oh my goodness, I have an issue here, right? I'm losing money, 
my biggest line item on my PL, I don't understand it. That's scary to me. At the same time, so he, he's like, I can't panic about this. But I also can't, even though I'm a brand new CEO and you're not supposed to change things in your first 100 days, right? Every good business book tells you not to change something in your first 100 days. And here he was like 45 days in. He's like, I can't hit snooze either because we're losing money. So I've got to address this now. So um, I'm, surp I'm surprised he doesn't have one of those believe um, posters in his office, but he does have that title last episode. So they reached out to us knowing that we did compensation work. And um, I think we'd been working with them also on their swing bed and had previously helped them with their um, a strategy session and cost report over the years. But we never done anything with them with their providers in the past. And so this new hospital CEO, um, he and I knew each other um, from his previous organization where I had helped him out with compensation. So he calls up, he's like, hey, the board is familiar with Stroudwater. You know, I, you and I know each other. Can you help us out looking at this compensation? We need to achieve some things. So we set up this engagement where we said we need to align. He's like, I need compensation to be uniform in the sense of there needs to be a strategy. And I want, and it needs to tie to the hospital strategy because we are losing money and we can't keep doing that. On top of that, we are looking at employing CRNAs for the first time. But they'd been very focused on employing primary care hospitalists and emergency medicine providers, but they had never employed a specialist. And so they were, they were looking at starting out with their CRNAs. So they wanted us to, hey, this might be a good time to reevaluate compensation because at least maybe with the CRNAs, we can set a strategy. We need to make sure our providers are taken care of and, you know, and what they need, what they feel like is fair and competitive compensation because they knew they were in a highly competitive market. Now, he knew he had a couple of high performers and he wanted to make sure that that was rewarded. So he specifically asked for productivity incentive to be considered. This organization had very, very rich benefits. Um, so, I mean, it was one of the best retirement matches I've seen. I think it was like 10%. So they had a pretty good benefits package and they knew that that needed to be taken into consideration. They also had generous PTO, um, PTO payouts that they were doing. Um, free lunch for some of the providers was actually part of their compensation package is that they could eat at the hospital whenever they wanted. Um, knew that he, whatever it was, it needed to be easily explained to the providers and they, so that it could meet their expectations and demands. He was concerned with, hey, I've heard about for industry best practices, but I'm a little bit concerned about compliance because I can't tell if we're in compliance with how it looks now. And then he wanted to make sure we had a consistency across the contracts. So here's the process we put together. We get data, we reviewed and analyzed. And back in September, you know, we, we had a leadership kickoff call where we met with the leadership of the organization. So the CMO, a medical director, CEO, CFO, board chair, um, and um, COO. And they, they didn't have a director of physician services at the time. And so we had a kickoff meeting with them and we said, okay, who, you know, we went over what the engagement looks like. And we said, in my experience, if you're going to change compensation, providers need to have a seat at the table. They need, we need to put together a provider compensation committee. What was unique about this organization is their providers had never been engaged and involved in any sort of committee. They had never been asked their opinion. <laughs> they had never collectively gathered together and like worked on an initiative. So let's decide to address compensation as your first big initiative of working together. So we put together this provider compensation committee, trying to have make sure we had good representation from hospital-based medicine um, and also the primary care clinic, right? We wanted to also have nurse practitioners and physicians at the table because we wanted a strategy that was gonna work for all the different providers. We did some educational sessions for the providers to let them know, here's what's going on in the market and also background, like why, why does he wanna address this? Why is this happening with the CEO? We went through and we interviewed every single provider in the organization to find out what was important to them. Amazingly, this was a first for me, lunch, free lunch for all the providers was something that they all wanted and was not negotiable. Any sort of compensation strategy that took away lunch or did not actually make lunch available to every single provider instead of just the physicians was not going to be acceptable. But there were some other things as well. One of the most interesting conversations was actually around provider benefits. There was a lot of benefits. They're like, yeah, we don't like these. Um, so we we took their feedback. 
we did more data analysis because we found out that actually a lot of providers took extra shifts. So the FTEs for all the providers was wrong because we were looking at total compensation and we were provided HR FTEs as opposed to actually worked FTEs. So we had to go back and redo a bunch of analysis when we found out, oh, people were doing these interviews and we're finding out people get more money if they take more shifts and that had not been in the original data. And so with that, we were able to develop a straw man for, you know, and we actually developed three different straw men of here's what compensation can look like. And we met with that compensation committee to get their feedback on it three different times. And one of the hard things that we had to do in this engagement in particular was because, as I mentioned, this was the very first time these providers were being asked to engage on a big initiative for the organization, right? They didn't even have a work group together necessarily of like provider leaders for the pandemic. So we had to actually do a lot of leadership development throughout this entire engagement of what does it mean to have a seat at that table? You're not representing yourself, right? You're representing the organization and the provider. So it's not just about, well, this is what I need for my W-2 compensation, right? This is what I need. But it's also not just being a, um, you know, playing the game of telephone and being a note taker where you go back and meet with everybody else and then you come back with all of their answers. You had to do some critical thinking of what's best for the organization, right? How does the how do these things align? What is the organizational strategy? What are we doing about the fact that the organization is in the red? So we really, I will say the compensation strategy that we came up with was very much co-created. There was administration at it. There were providers at it. Stroudwater was at the table kind of facilitating the discussion and doing all the modeling and like going over all the legalese and stuff. We actually got legal involved to make sure you know, from an employment law, but they had an employment law specialist they brought in to look at certain things about the fact that like the LCSWs historically had been hourly and that they were um, non-exempt employees. So can we have the same comp strategy and how does that apply, apply to exempt versus non-exempt employees? And then we went about, so we did all of this work and then it's time, time to do actual implementation, right? Including compliance. So some of the things we found out when we did the interviews work with the comp committee is, you know, this is, this was direct from, you know, how we put together um, the strategies was getting these types of, there were the, the benefits package and they did not like the idea of tuition repayment. They didn't mind twi like student loan repayment for the physician stuff, but they did not. But a lot of the or people are like, I've already finished my degrees you know, tuition payment of like sending me off to school that the organization had is not a benefit to me. I don't care about it. Um, they also were concerned about the fact that health insurance, you know, the premiums for the organization, they're like, this is a lot higher. I don't want this to be part of my back package because I'd be better off going off and getting it in the market. Um, they recognized that there was an independent rural health clinic right across the street. And so they want to know, well, what are they making, right? You want to talk about market level, What's what are they making across the street? Obviously, we don't we can't just go across the street and be like, hey, give us all of your compensation data. You're an independent clinic, but we needed to make it. We had to pay attention to whatever they're doing across the street. It get, it gets back, and providers want to make sure that they're being competitive, um, especially in the primary care space. There were some very cons big concerns about if we if we want productivity incentives. And remember from the earlier slide, the CEO specifically want asked for. I want to somehow have productivity taken into consideration. Well, the providers historically had never been engaged with, with the data. So they were concerned, is this valid? Is it inconsistent? You know, how do I pull it out of my system? They happen to be on Athena, which Athena has a lot of great things, but if you don't put the query into Athena the exact same way every single time, guess what? It spits out a different number every single time for any of those of you who are on Athena. Um, ECW is a lot easier to, man to manage with that. So um, they were also, you know, hey, productivity is just, that's for larger organizations. It's not for us. Um, they were really concerned about getting the data themselves. So they are like, once upon a time, I used to get emails about my denials and my coding management and I had to get feedback so I could properly code. And so therefore I know my productivity was accurate and I haven't seen that in a long time. Um, I'm worried, you know, and there were some things that had nothing to do with compensation about, hey, prior authorizations that came out in the interviews and we revert it to revenue cycle. 
And they wanted to make sure that compensation aligned with what the reality of practicing in rural actually looked like. So it's really good feedback from the providers. Now, some of it, it had to be listened. The benefits package, there's going to be stuff that some people use and some people don't. But certain things have to be, from an employment law standpoint, are tied to the organization, right? Health insurance, you can have an opt-out provision, but you can't, it's not going to be an apples to apples of if the value in the organization, if the cost of the organization is $35,000 per person or per family for health insurance, it's not like the hospital can just hand you a check for $35,000 if you don't want insurance through the hospital, right? It's not going to be apples to apples like that. So, um, you know, there's a lot of things that about the benefits packages that we couldn't necessarily do unless they were willing to take it away from the whole organization. But there were some things that needed to be more uniform that hadn't been across the benefits package. Not everybody got PTO. Um, and so who should get PTO? Well, we had to go through the whole exercise of hospital-based practices. They were set, they had a set number of shifts they were supposed to take each month, which means that their PTO was baked into what their shift amounts were. So they didn't get separate, P we had to agree that they weren't gonna get separate PTO on top of that, which would allow them to take certain shifts off that they were scheduled for. So there was a lot of provider education that had to go about. And so when I talked about that leadership aspect, a lot of this was you know, helping them and training those people at the compensation committee to how do you discuss this type of stuff with the other providers? How do you communicate this? Are you just regurgitating it? How are you, you know, putting it in the context of the organization, listening to their concerns, and then thinking about their concerns and what your suggestions are coming out of it? So, you know, we looked at, okay, here were the goals that we set forth, and they said um, uh, with, with the organization. So we had family medicine, behavioral health, ED, hospice, wound care. CRNAs were dealt with separately because it was a 1099 conversion, but they were included in these meetings. So, but the comp plan was okay for them evaluating 1099 versus not. Their current model, everybody had a base salary and benefits with no set incentives, but they random people would have add-ons. Some people got housing, some people did not get housing, some people got a sign-on bonus, some people had medical directorships, some people had loan prepayments. You couldn't, there was no rhyme or reason as to who got what. And so, you know, we said, okay, how do we get to best practices? When I said, all right, look, base salary, productivity, quality for a lot of the clinical-based specialties, right? For those that were hospital-based, base salary and benefits, quality and symptoms and excess shifts, right? Instead of productivity being measured by work RVUs or RHC visits, they should be based off of taking more shifts than what was required. Now, here was the issue with, you know, in them thinking about where do we go from where we are and where we want to go, was a lot of their providers covered multiple areas. You had providers who were in clinic-based medicine part of the time, and they also took hospital shifts, and they also took ED shifts. And so how do you have providers who might overlap into different comp plans? How do you solve for that? How did you solve for most of your wound care clinic providers were also hospitalists? And they would literally go and do, and sometimes get called from wound care and move up to go and do um, uh, you know, up onto the med search board to do wound care up there, right? For, you know, when a hospitalist would call them in. And then the next day they'd actually be doing a hospitalist shift. So we had to work through a lot of this. And part of how we did this was, um, you know, we basically started looking at how do we set base salary, you know? And we decided to set it, we decided to use MGMA data, the providers, we looked at Midwest versus rural versus national data. And how do we make it as apples to apples and what information do we have access to? But they wanted, so we, we came up with a way to set, here's what base salary is, but it could be adjusted up to 10% for things that were specific criteria to the hospital that they were, that the providers said were important. They really cared about whether or not you had rural experience. They wanted to reward loyalty to the organization, so tenure. So somebody who'd been there for 10, 15 years should be paid more in their, for, for this organization than somebody who had just joined in their recent years. And then really, if you, are if you are able to step into multiple departments, how do we take that into consideration your base salary? So what we did is we said, Here's the, here's the base for everybody within a specialty. So we said MGM, we looked at the MGMA data and said, here's the base for this specialty. 
knowing that MGMA had total cash compensation, that was a big deal because a lot of the nurse practitioners thought that was base salary. So we did that. We did some benchmarking of like what was an appropriate base salary to set it at where we could add incentives on top of that and not be outside of compliance. So here's base. And then we said, Rural experience was the was the most important. So that was up worth. If you had enough rural experience, you got up to an additional 5% compensation for that. Then tenure at the organization was worth an additional 1% and then 4% retail, related to working in multiple different departments. Because we recognize the reason why tenure, which originally had a much higher percentage tied to it, was they realized that yes, loyalty needed to be rewarded, but just because you've been here for a long time did not mean you were doing more work, higher quality work, et cetera. So when the providers really dug into tenure, which they originally ranked very highly, they decided actually we're going to back off of that because they were trying to tie it to what is going to drive organizational success. And just because you had been here longer didn't mean that the hospital made any more money, didn't mean that you were seeing more patients, right? And it mean you were taking more shifts. And so when they added all those things up together, they decide, they the providers decided to reduce how much was tied to tenure. They did decide that productivity incentives for clinic-based providers was appropriate, but they did not want to implement that for at least one year because they wanted to make sure that the data was believable. We didn't have issues. They were worried about data issues. But the more we ran the data and the more consistent they saw it, they realized that wasn't su um, such a huge concern. And then they wanted to make sure that there was a premium paid of here's an, if you take, here's your set number of shifts, if you were for hospital-based um, people or shift-based um, providers, if you take extra shifts, it avoids the cost of locums for the hospital. What is the premium associated with taking extra shifts? Now, one of the key things about the taking extra shifts is we needed to make sure that providers, that the, you only got the premium applied to taking extra shifts if you were to already at a 1.0 FTE. And the reason why that was so important is what, one of the reasons why the compensation was so screwy previously is that they actually had a lot of providers, they were already doing an extra shift premium, right? But it was a big premium. It was like an additional 30%. So a lot of providers were actually only like a 0.6 FTE, and they were taking enough extra shifts that actually made them a 1.0 because they were basically getting a 30% premium on all of those extra shifts. That was problematic because you had people who were employed as a 1.0 making one amount, those working as a 1.0 making a completely different amount because of how they categorized themselves in their contract as a 0.6 FTE or lower, all right? So we agreed that, you know what, extra shifts, should get extra compensation. There should be a premium, but only after you do a 1.0. You still get extra compensation for shifts, but it's going to be the same as though you were like actually a 1.0. So we took the total amount of base for a 1.0 and divided it by the number of shifts and said, here's the comp. Once you increase over a 1.0, then we applied the premium. On top of that, so compensation is oftentimes a board issue. So we had to really engage with the board of directors and keep them educated as to what was going on. The board approved doing a one-year guarantee. And I really recommend guaranteeing comp that you have to have a transition plan available for this, especially in an organization where there was no strategy. This isn't a small change. This was a complete overhaul to compensation. And so they recognized that they had some operational improvement initiatives. As I said, the organization was losing money at the time that we got that we started this engagement. And so they made the one-year guarantee contingent upon actually the providers needed to be at the table and coming up with the solutions to help with the operational improvement initiatives. If they agreed to that, then they would guarantee it for a year. So after we got through all of that, we had to redraft all the contracts for the providers. We actually did this comp plan, um, getting it written up so that it could be handed over to a provider at any time by specialty. So the hospitalist had the language in there for the extra shifts the clinicians had. And then for, in their individual contracts, it would reference, hey, you are this amount under this comp plan because you're primary care. But if you take hospitalist shifts, this comp plan applies to you for those shifts. So we had to go through that. Then it was actually, this was really important. We said we met with every single individual provider and showed them a side-by-side -side comparison of what their compensation was right now 
under a one-year guarantee and what was it expected to be basically two years out. And that way, and then we also, for some providers who, especially those who were concerned about productivity, we showed them, we did scenario modeling for them of them saying, okay, what if I see, I get 17 patients a day, what happens to my compensation? So we did live modeling in front of the providers, basically of letting them play with, okay, show me what it looks like if I see 10 patients a day. What if I see 17 patients a day? What if I see 24 patients a day, right? And so that way they could have conversations also about the operational improvements of, well, if I saw that many patients a day, the only way I could do that is if I had another MA. What's, how realistic is that? Can I get another MA? What would be the time frame of doing that? So we were able to actually have very operational um, conversations while we were having compensation stuff. And on top of that, you know, there, this is an organization when I came in that they said, we can't recruit anybody here, right? We don't know how to get anybody in. We've been way, like we've been really, really struggling for the past three years to get any new providers. And they've actually been able to successfully recruit new providers into the organization, even with undergoing a whole comp plan. So actually the new providers that have joined the organization have appreciated, oh my goodness, this is transparent. I know how I'm going to get paid. It all makes sense. It's laid out to me as opposed to just feeling like they're just negotiating on their behalf and who knows what happens tomorrow if it's a different CEO. So a very interesting engagement, very um, difficult engagement at certain times working with the data. But I have to say part of what the two biggest drivers to this organization doing this successfully, right? Engaging the providers and being transparent with them. Full up front, here's why we're doing this. Here's what we want to achieve with it, what do you guys want to achieve? You know, what you guys have never had to go through, you've never done any big leadership initiative before, let's go ahead and get you trained up on that. Let's provide opportunities and not just put it on your shoulders to figure it out, you know, and have it perfect from day one. So I think the original time frame that the CEO was originally hoped for was like 60 days. And I'm like, and I pushed back saying, you're not gonna be able to do overhaul compensation in 60 days by any means, especially where you're at right now. And he's like, okay, I want to do this right. Right is better than fast. It has to be right. Cause I'm only, I'm a new CEO. I'm only going to get one shot at the uh, shot at doing this. Um, if I end up having a major overhaul, I'm going to be out the door. And so we took it, we basically engaged with the providers to set the pace of doing this engagement. So yes, there's times when you have to move really, really quickly, but you need to balance that. Don't panic right? So that you can do it right. Don't wait until it's too late. Don't panic. Don't hit that snooze button. Take it at the pace you need to, to get it right. Because you don't want to go through this year over year after year. But the beautiful thing is, is if you go through this and you actually set a strong compensation strategy that aligns with the organizational strategy, you shouldn't have to redo this. You can have that comp committee come back together every two, three years. How is it going? Is it working? Is it Has the organizational strategy changed? If it hasn't, then do we need to change anything? Has the market changed? Has the composition of our providers changed? If it hasn't, we can keep going. If it has, what do we need to readjust? What can we tweak rather than overhaul, right? Because we're not going to, hopefully, not on wood, get another pandemic that's going to upheaval, like create such upheaval. We're not going to have such massive industry events happening in a short period of time that, hey, a strategy that you had, if you had a good strategy in 2019, it was out the door in 2022, right? And I will say organizations that had a good strategy in 2019 were able to tweak theirs to meet 2022. So with that, I did, I promise, uh, I promised people I'd save some time for questions. And so I really appreciate everybody today, but what questions do we have about this engagement? Um, all right, a question that came in is, I understand a transition period, but if the hospital had financial challenges, I assume someone's comp had to go down. Did those providers increase their productivity or did they eventually depart? That's a really great question. So as I noted that the board approved a one-year guarantee contingent on operational improvement, right? And so before the board would actually fully bless that one year guarantee, we acted, the providers actually had to, um, they worked with us and also Whipfully to put together an operational improvement plan for how they were going to do stuff. And so one of the things that they did actually, because they had some overstaffing and they didn't want to actually just 
hey, caused some of these providers to depart is they looked at their overall strategy. This is a very abundant, if you guys have met Eric Shell, this was a very abundance-minded CEO who did not want to have layoffs and he didn't want to cut services. So what they did is they actually examined what are the service areas we were trying to grow. And with providers who were worried about, hey, I don't know if I can see more patients in this, do you have interest in working on one of these new services that we are trying to launch? Okay, first of all, I know a lot of you are like, wait a minute, if they're having operational problems, how are they launching new services? They've realized growth was their way out of the red, right? Was really through growth. What services can we add? So we actually had a couple of providers. Wound care was one of the biggest ones, but there was also pain. There was a CRNA who actually expressed, you know what, I can develop a pain clinic and I think I'm more likely to hit my compensation targets if I focus in on what can I improve in pain. So we did have, um, we had a few providers who departed and the ones that did, um, that departed were ones who said, hey, I, I really just want to specialize in one area and do these kinds of shifts. And I don't want to be able to, really in rural hospitals, I see most providers needing to be able to do hospital, like there's a lot of sharing between hospitalists and ED. And there were a couple of providers who they came up with their operational plan of how they were going to share APPs. And there was a couple of physicians who were not on board with that. And so um, the a couple we did have a couple of departures, but I will say pretty much every primary care provider was able to increase their productivity. We show, I mean, they had wait lists. They had wait lists for patients to come in. And yet for some reason, we had providers only seeing 10 patients a day. And so you can't have a wait list and only see 10 patients a day. So we had providers increase their productivity. We had providers shift into a different area, primarily wound care and pain. And then we had the providers who did not agree with the operational improvement plans that actually departed. Um, okay, another question. Especially with increasing payer scrutiny, documentation requirements aren't getting any simpler. That is very true. Are there ways you have helped organizations align documentation, completion, accuracy with compensation? Yes. So I'm one of those, I may keep it simple, stupid kind of person of where I like to actually, there's all kinds of fancy trackers out there, et cetera. For me, simple Excel workbook of all, you know, and, and I'll help somebody set this one, one up. No big deal of like have all the providers have the main terms of the contract. And that's part of where the compensation design of keeping it simple. If you have some people who had really crazy idea, great ideas, but it was going to make compensation too complicated, right? If you can't accurately track it, then HR and payroll are going to hate you. And, there, and one of the compliance issues is if you don't pay consistent with your contract. So you don't want to get overly cutesy of like, let's add this and let's add that and let's add that if you can't track it with accuracy. So um, setting people up with a simple tracker. And one of the big things is because the board, what they were going through a financial improvement, the board needed. So we actually helped them create a tracker that they could just refresh basically so And it would generate their board report for them every quarter so that the board can monitor what is our progress, what's the improvement, how are we benchmarking. So we built that out for them, really easy to help them with it. And that way they actually, we did some, um, some of them required um, fair market valuation opinions, particularly their CMO, right, because of the specific responsibilities that that provider was both clinical and administrative um, and some transitions they were going through with that role. But um, having that, it actually really helps them from a compliance standpoint if CMS ever comes knocking, because we did not, you know, their goal wasn't to make it perfect 50-50, right? Of like 50 percentile compensation, 50 percentile productivity. It was, if we're going to have a variance, can we explain it? And now that board report is a really good piece of documentation that is super easy for them. They're trained on how to update it themselves. It's built for them. And then Here's our documentation, here's our variance, and we know exactly why it exists. Um, what experience do you have with specialty providers moving to an hourly rate versus billing for service and cause? That's a great question. So, you know, both of those things really exist. We're working with a hospital right now that actually their specialists are all um, independent um, providers and they all want to contract differently. Some of them want a per quick rate, some of them want an hourly rate. I will say um, a couple of things. So the hourly rate, I prefer 
the hourly rate is not my favorite, especially for a physician. I would prefer a shift rate, right? The big thing, the reason why some organizations want an hourly rate, especially for a surgeon, if you're a visiting surgeon, is, well, what if surgery gets done early, right? What if they get done at one in the afternoon? I don't want to pay a full shift and have the provider twiddling their thumbs until three o'clock, you know, just because they, and, you know, but I don't want to discourage them from being efficient, you know, I don't want to pay for that. And so it's kind of balancing with the providers that you actually have and what their goals are. I usually prefer a shift rate for contract. Now, when it comes to billing for services, so um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by this question as far as are you talking about coverage, right, of saying especially, hey, I want you to provide 24-7 coverage, those kinds of like billing for that service and then here's the contract for that specific service because that's very hot. Um, common, especially in the emergency department or certain specialties, right? If I'm going to provide this level of coverage, I'm not going to have a separate call rate versus in-person, you know, an activation. And so those ones, um, you know, saying, okay, here's the scope of the services and here's what I'm going to pay you for that scope. It's pretty easy to actually convert between those things. My big thing is, is I like consistency because of the compliance risk. Right. That like that's that's a big issue that we see is the more variations you have of different contracts, especially within a specific specialty, there's a problem. I really only like if you're talking about billing for services in a per click um, mentality, I really only like that usually for like radiology, um, pathology, some those ones or like a telehealth, like a telecardiology one that I just worked on. We definitely set up a per click rate. It's 24 seven coverage, but we really needed to tie it to how frequently we actually needed it, even if it was 24 seven coverage. Um, somebody asked, discuss the nuances of call coverage responsibilities in FMV. For instance, a surgeon in a small town may be one and two or one and three, while larger urban groups may be much less. How can the increased call coverage be valued? That's a great answer. And that is actually, there is um, a lot of information. Like we, we have what's called a call burden formula that we use to do the fair market valuations. So that call um, call burden calculator looks at what is that burden? So we measure things such as what is your trauma level? Is it restricted versus unrestricted call? You know, Do you have to stay on the grounds? Do you have to respond within 30 minutes? Do you have to respond telephonically within 30 minutes versus do you have to present in person? Are you have, do you have to have a certain mileage distance? How are you paid? Do you, if you're paid on productivity, um, do work RVUs during call count towards your productivity incentives if you're an employed provider or if you have that in your contract? What is that call rotation? So recognizing that a one and two or a one and three call rotation, what is we look at what is the national average um, for that specialty? Is it a one and five? Is it a one and seven? And you're only at a one and two. Um, that means you're going you're gonna to have to increase that compensation. We look at your overall, especially if it's an independent group and they're going to bill for the professional fees. Are they, you know, what is your payer mix? Do they have risk of, hey, they're covering your ED and they're gonna end up with a bunch of Medicaid patients that they don't normally have in their clinic. So we have that call burden basically calculator that says, okay, here's the typical rate. Here's the, you know, the median or the national rate for that coverage. And then we have all these pluses and minus factors on that call burden that helps us generate a fair market value range. We The biggest thing is whether or not we can get access to the data of how frequently and how much time do they have to come in so that I can weigh in what's active clinical care versus what's called a beeper rate. You have to be available. It inconveniences your life, but you're not actively seeing patients. Um, so that's one of the big things. Um, I know we're over on time. I apologize for that. So I do appreciate the but really great questions that are really important. Um, if people have other questions, feel free to reach out. If there was, it looks like there's a may, might be a couple more. We will email out the answers to the questions with the presentation itself. Um, that being said, please, I know that you know we're over time, but for those of you who are still on, please, please, please fill out the survey. We thank you for attending the conference this year. It's been a great conference the past couple of weeks doing these in the different regions. That survey really helps us determine what you guys need. How can we help you? You know, what education, what do we need to keep you up to date on so that you guys can be the best critical access hospitals you can be, be financially sustainable and stay on top of the rules. One last plug though, 
As I said, we have done our second annual rural provider um, compensation survey. We're going to be publishing those results at the end of July. For those who filled out the survey, they do get more detail, right? So we're going to be reporting median lows and highs in compensation across the different specialties, showing different breakouts for rural health clinics, critical access hospitals, regional data, et cetera. But if you filled out the survey, you do get more detailed information, 25th percentiles, 75th percentiles, et cetera, for free. There, it is, you know, it's, and so I say that to encourage, for those of you who have not participated in the past, please, please consider participating in the future because it does give you access to more data. We wanna appreciate the effort that you take to fill it out. I promise it's it's not the 200 questions that take six and a half hours that MGMA does, even though that's a very valuable survey. It is, it's designed specifically recognizing that at our rural hospitals, whoever's filling it out has 20 other jobs that they also have to do. So thank you guys again for joining us. Um, and you know, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Hillary to go live with the uh with the survey. Thank you so much, Opal, and thank you for everyone who joined us today. Um if we missed your question, um, I will pass it to Opal and um, we will get back to you to follow up on that. Um, thank you everyone for your participation, your feedback, and we hope to see you again next year.